Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the undergrad undergraduate webinar series, an interactive online platform connecting high school students to the Ashoka Ashoka University community. In this series, we aim to cover topics related to the Ashoka to related to Ashoka's undergraduate program. Our esteemed faculty academic counselors will guide you in the understanding the various aspects of the university, including academics, admissions, and financial aid, career opportunities. and campus life amongst other topics the recordings of these uh, previous sessions are available on ashoka's uh, youtube channel the link to which is provided in the chat box and uh, i am really glad i am really delighted to be able to moderate this session and uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today in today's session why study at ashoka why study history at ashoka and i am uh, revanth ukkalam of uh, undergraduate batch 2020 i am doing my current current ashoka scholars program and my major is history and that is why i am moderating the session in fact and uh, i consider it my honor to introduce you uh, to my uh, introduce to you my favorite and someone we at ashoka consider to be a go to for his very generous uh, help and advice always and somebody who uh, from whose offices we can come back with an unending uh, book reading list and uh, and there's and, and there's a joke runs in ashoka history community that his very cryptic mails can instantly make you an epigraphist master epigraphist and probably suitably he is uh, mahesh rangarajan uh, the hod or history of uh, the head of department of the history uh, faculty and professor mahesh rangarajan also is a professor of history and environmental studies at ashoka university prior to this prior to this uh, professor rangarajan has been a professor in modern indian history at the university of delhi and also taught at the universities of cornell and jadavpur and at the ncb and at ncbs national center for biological studies in bangalore he has he has also served as director of the nehru memorial museum and library new delhi he has a ba in history from hindu college uh, university of delhi and an ma Uh, from Balliol College and uh, DPhil from Nuffield College, both from Oxford University. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He worked as a, an assistant uh, editor with the Telegraph, Kolkata, and has been a junior fellow of the NMML. Uh, he has served as corresponding editor, Environment and History, and was also on the editorial board of Conservation and Society. Professor Rangarajan is the author of Fencing and Forest. Conservation and Ecological Change in India's Central Provinces, 1860 to 1914; India's Wildlife History and Introduction; and Nature and Nation: Essays on Environmental History. He edited the books "Environmental Issues in India," a reader and Ox, a reader, and the Oxford Anthology of Indian Wildlife, Volumes One and Two. He is also the co-editor of several other books. So, without further further ado, I would request Professor Rangarajan to take over this session. and and i really await this and this certainly illuminating uh, program thank you revant uh, it's always a privilege to speak to students even more of a privilege to speak to parents and it's a pleasure to find alumni willing to listen to you when you imagine they probably got bored of listening to all these years uh, why study history why study history at all and why study history at ashoka these are not easy questions to answer you could make it even shorter and ask why study why study at all one of the major attractions of university life is that it's uh, probably the best time of any man's life you make new friends uh, you always make new friends but the friends you make in uh, university and college probably stay with you for much longer but more as important as the friends you make is what you learn and one of the fascinating things about history as a discipline is that it is going through enormous changes in the way we look at the past in the way we interrogate the past in the way we think about the past when we look into the future ashoka has a small history department there are many eminent and fine departments in india many eminent and fine universities in india and the historians in those universities are part of a fraternity they are our brothers and sisters i do not in any way wish to impunge on the wonderful work they are doing please remember all of us who teach at ashoka are the products of other universities what we are attempting here we think is something better 
We also hope it will eventually be something which turns out to be new. So over the last six years, the Department of History has tried to craft a bachelor's in history. And to do the bachelor's in history, you need to do 12 courses in history. Seven are compulsories, five are optionals. And the optionals are chosen from a range of electives. I'm happy to say this year, that is in the year 2021, we are offering, I think, at last count, 22 electives, and you can do any five. The idea of the seven, and there's one called reading history, there's one called reading archaeology, there's one in European history, these are compulsories, is to equip the student with an understanding of how historians think and what historians do in order not just to think, but to make arguments, not about just what happened in the past. So we all know that Babur won in the Battle of Panipat in 1526, or that it was the soldiers of the East India Company and Robert Clive who led the EIC army to its famous and epochal victory at Palashi. But why are they important historical facts? They're important historical facts because from these victories flowed a set of political, social, economic, cultural consequences. There are other ways to look at change. When he was asked in the year 2000 by uh, a leading newspaper, what was the most important change of the last 2000 years in the history of Europe? The economic historian Carlo Cipolla did not refer to the Industrial Revolution, to the World Wars, to the Crusades, to the wars of religion of the Protestants and Catholics. He referred to something completely different. He referred to the introduction of the beam. So the next time you see Rajma or Chole or green beans or any of the multiple forms of beans we, we see, we should think of Chipola's comment. And he wrote an elegant uh, essay of 800 words, which was based on a lifetime of research. He explained something which all of us know, which was not known to the people who introduced the bean, that the bean is a leguminous plant. It has in its uh, nodules uh, of its roots uh, various bacteria, which take the nitrogen from the air and fix it in the soil. And until the synthesis of ammonia in the early 1900s by Haber and Bosch, two brilliant German chemists, humans had no way of synthesizing ammonia. So the synthesis of ammonia being unknown and in the dim and distant future, but this cultivation of beans and the fixing of nitrogen in the soil made it possible after the harvest to sow a fresh crop. And there was a three field system of wheat, barley, rye, beans, which then became very widespread in Europe. The three field system then had widespread implications because there was protein available in the form of leguminous crops. The soil could be fertilized, more people could be supported, very importantly, more horses and cattle, which provided draft power or which enabled military mobility um, and human mobility in an age when fossil fuels were unknown, uh, became possible. So the idea of having reading archaeology is also to remind us that we are living on an earth where humans have been present not for centuries, but for millennia. And the history of South Asia doesn't begin with Harappa or for that matter with the coming of the plow or with the rise of cities uh, in uh, peninsular India and the Gangetic Basin or the clearing of the forests. But it, it began much earlier with hominid arrivals and hominid arrivals in uh, South Asia. So reading archaeology also reminds us that we look at material remains in the present. Archaeology is not only about the dim and distant past. So along with an understanding of archaeology, so important in an era of climate change, so what does the last thousand years of the monsoon do to how we understand habitability, survival, sustenance in different parts of this vast subcontinent. There's also a very fascinating paper on reading history in which students read texts. It could be the history of the Peloponnesian War. It could be the edicts of Ashoka. It could be some of the very important uh, remains uh, with where Roman coins have been found in ports on the south uh, east coast of India. Uh, and reading history gives us a sense of how history is not just about what happened in the past, but the why and how. I was briefly uh, Dean of Academic Affairs at Ashoka. And besides, uh, meeting students and working with faculty and working out timetables and convincing people that your grades are actually much better than they look to you. Uh, one of the very pleasant duties I had was to engage with parents. And uh, I met a somewhat distant cousin of mine whom I didn't recognize at first sight with uh, her spouse and uh, their daughter. 
and uh, they wanted to know why study history. Now, we all know India became independent on 15th August 1947. What's so new about the history you teach in Ashoka? So I explained that along with these papers, reading history, reading archaeology, urban history, we have four mandatory papers on Indian history. And one of the papers, I'm one of the people involved in teaching it, is on the history of India, part four, 1757, since the Battle of Palashi uh, to 1967, because we don't stop in 47. So I explained that everybody knows India became independent on 15th August 1947. But if you ask why, why then? And why then and with what consequences? The answers are not as simple as seems at first sight. The simple answer would be that Lord Louis Mountbatten had been made Viceroy of India. And when deputing him, Prime Minister at least said, that India will be independent by June 1948. Mountbatten fixed 15th August because it's the day he had taken surrender in 1945 uh, from the Axis powers in South uh, East Asia where he was Supreme Commander. But the other reason, of course, has to do not just with the will of one man, Atli, or another Mountbatten, but the fact that after the 1942 movement, it became evident that the British would not be able to hold down India by force because over the two years after that, or five years after that, they also uh, were an exhausted power. There were two and a half million men in the British Indian Army, but by 1946, 47, they were not sure that the orders they gave would be carried out. They'd lost control increasingly of their armed forces and might. They'd had a loss of will. Their economy was enormously exhausted because believe it or not, Britain was one of the countries which lost the war. It was on the winning side, but in order to win, it had to expend resources become a debtor to the United States. And one of the important elements of the war is that the US had no commitment whatsoever, nor did the USSR, to keeping the British, French, Dutch, and other European empires intact. So the war which meant the end of the Axis also signaled the end of empire. So the victory of the British in uh, Southeast Asia and Europe also signaled the coming defeat. The other point, of course, about 1947 is that freedom came with partition. Indians wanted freedom, but we did not agree on what we meant by freedom. And the creation of Pakistan, the partition of India, of course, had also to do with British policies. When empires retreat, they don't just collapse. They continue to attempt uh, not divide and rule, but as Penderil Moon famously said in an aside, divide and quit. So I think that this might give you a sense of the way in which uh, we study history at Ashoka. We ask questions about why, what, when, and where. And that's not unique to us. I would not like to say unique, but I would emphasize that the history department at Ashoka consists of different scholars, of different persuasions, different approaches, and different skills. Uh, without uh, in any way uh, being boastful, I do think that while we are a small department, we would like to think that we make up uh, for it with quality and particularly with diversity. So I'm a senior uh, scholar, uh, Professor Rudranshu Mukherjee, who worked on 1857 for his doctorate many years ago at Oxford, continues to be enthralled by it. He teaches an elective on 1857. He's the only person on earth that I know, maybe there are others, you can mail me or SMS me, who has three papers or electives in a period of two years entitled Reading Marx, predictable, Reading Gandhi, predictable, and Reading the Gita. I don't think there's anyone who teaches that combination. Uh, we also have uh, Professor Upinder Singh, recipient of the Infosys Prize, uh, who has just done a fascinating book on political violence in ancient India. She's written the major book which is used across this country on the history of early India. She's uh, had a range of works, including on archaeology, on history, and on ancient Delhi. Professor Nainjot Lahiri, also recipient of the Infosys Prize, uh, has a somewhat unique claim. Uh, hers was one of the first books written by Ashoka faculty. Remember, we're a young university. And believe it or not, it's a biography of Ashoka. Of course, she wrote it up before she joined, but happily it came out just on time. And anyone who visits her room will see something which, believe me, I never thought I would see, uh, uh, a photograph or a sculpture of Ashoka uh, found in digs in the uh, early 2000s. Uh, somewhat to my disappointment, this Ashoka looks like a Glaxo baby. He's a very cute looking looks like a cute little boy, not at all what we imagined he was when we read about him in comics. And Professor Lahiri teaches a range of papers, including on humor and wit in the ancient world, food and drink in the ancient world, reading archaeology, the history of India, volume one. 
And as with others, she also has doctoral students because we have a doctoral program. And one of the pluses with the doctoral program is that doctoral students also work as teaching fellows. So you will come in contact with the doctoral students as an undergraduate. That's three. I can also add a very important new entrant in our department, Professor Sunil Khilnani, widely known for his book, The Idea of India. He wears two hats. One is the politics hat because he's in the politics department. The other is the history hat. So he's teaching two fascinating papers, reading uh, the 20th century and Indian politics in, uh, uh, you know, in the 20th century. There's Professor uh, Srinath Raghavan, uh, somewhat unusual. He served a commission in the Indian Army. Predictably, his first book was on war and peace in modern India. He's also written 1971. He's written a long-term history of Indo-US relations. So he teaches a, a, a range of papers related to these themes. Uh, we also have uh, a very important historian who's just won a British Academy Award, uh, Dr. Aparna Vaidik, who's associate professor, who did very interesting work on uh, exiles and political prisoners in the Andamans, and is just completing a book on revolutionaries of late 20th century India. Uh, there's uh, Dr. Pratyanath, a climates of war, Mughal historian, who's worked very extensively on the uh, early modern world, teaches in the paper on environment and empire in the uh, early modern world. He also teaches one on war and society in South Asia. One of the pluses uh, with our department is, of course, we also have visiting scholars. There are a number of them, Niradri Bhattacharya, who was at JNU for many years, Professor Kapil Raj from Europe, and there are many others. There's Professor uh, Dr. Sanjukta Datta, who's been here as a temp, and she's uh, presently teaching a range of papers on ancient India. So one of the pluses in Ashoka is you get to sample different kinds of history. You learn history in different ways, in new ways, about methods, about sources. Our classes are not based on a hard set syllabus. Uh, the, the assignments vary depending on the teacher. They are based on a lot of discussion. Uh, normally the electives are capped at 20. Uh, the mandatories have uh, larger numbers. I also want to emphasize, uh, I'm, I'm happy Revant reminded me, that one of the things our department has done over the last few years, open to all students, is to have language training. And we have uh, Sanskrit taught by uh, uh, Asutosh Dayal Mathur, very distinguished scholar from St. Stephen's College, and Dr. Nadeem Akhtar, who's teaching Persian. One of the pluses in Ashoka is that unlike in the regular Indian university system, of which people like me were a product, uh, you don't just study one discipline. When you join Ashoka, you do a series of foundation courses, uh, environmental studies, Indian civilizations are compulsory. In the rest, there's a range of options. You go in for three uh, seminars on critical thinking, where you learn how to write, to argue a case. You learn that there's not one, but two or three or four sides to a case. And the important thing is to state your case, argue your premises, not just tear your opponent apart, but to learn to think critically. So along with history, you could possibly do a joint uh, a BA you'd have to do more uh, uh, compulsories. For instance, in IR, international relations, which is a minor in Ashoka. The number of students presently do history with IR. But there is also provision to do a minor. You don't do 12, you do six courses and a concentration where you do four courses. Two questions we are always asked, how is the teaching of history or any other discipline different or better at Ashoka compared to other universities? Uh, without mincing words, I think that uh, much of the Indian university system tends to be based on exams handed, held at the end of the term or at the end of the year. And for a variety of reasons for which the teachers are in no way to blame, much of this is often based on broke learning. Uh, the story was if you studied the last three years question papers and you predicted this year's, you cracked it. I don't think that's possible here because as I explained, each of the professor's grades and questions in different ways. It's a transparent system. You learn right at the beginning. And this participation continues through the term. In some cases, there's an end of term exam. In all, in all cases, there's also provision for participation and feedback. So that's one. The second, and I think is very important, is that we don't see education as restricted to disciplines in the sense of a silo. So if, suppose you were to study um, uh, archaeology, uh, uh, reading archaeology, we think it will influence the way you look at history in general. Similarly, if you were to do Indian civilizations, it would affect the way you look at civilizations in general. The other point about Ashoka is that the electives in history at least are open. So you could be in a class, I just taught a class, Raven was in it, Society and Politics in India. There were 
20 people there. Revant was teaching assistant this year. He was in the class last year. And I was just counting those 20 came from six different departments in Ashoka. I taught a paper for many years on animal histories. And believe it or not, uh, sometimes you felt you were in Noah's Ark. Those 20 students, 25 at one stage, were from uh, almost all the major. They, I think at that time we had 12 majors. I think there were students from 10 of them over there. They all came with very different premises on the relations of animals to history. And we tried to, I tried to design not the general readings, which were common, but the book review presentations around the interests of those people. So I think there's much more attention to individual learning and thinking. Uh, there's no penalizing for critical thinking. There's actually encouragement of it. And the evolution of history happens not only with the social sciences of which it is a part, but the humanities. So the school of humanities, of social sciences, of natural sciences, of economics, we work together. So a student walking into Ashoka and being here for three years would encounter people from a range of disciplines within the classroom. And I think this is very important because one of the dilemmas or the limitations of the Indian system was this segregation, ghetto-like, into the arts, the sciences, the commerce, the engineering, the law, the medicine. Now, I regret we don't have law, engineering, medicine in Ashoka. We don't plan to. We have excellent places in India which specialize and doing a great job in these. But we do believe that we are trying to give a more holistic sense, not only of one discipline, but all. There are a number of questions and answers. So let me just, uh, his history honors the best course if we want to become IAS. Believe me, I have no idea. Uh, the IAS exam changes over time. And uh, if you look at the IAS, I'm sure you'll recognize over the last 20 years, most of the toppers are from more exact sciences than history. But yes, if you do want to attempt the competitive civil service exam, history is never a bad bet. How do we see history with interdisciplinary subjects? History is a discipline. It's a discipline with certain methods, approaches, and ideas of how to assess facts and evidence. It has evolved in association and dialogue with other disciplines. And these dialogues are vital to history as a discipline. But in the search for interdisciplinarity, it will be very unfortunate if we discard the idea of disciplinary thinking. So when this is my view, this is not my university's view. When we think of disciplines such as chemistry, philosophy, mathematics, history, economics, many of these originated in the continental universities in Germany or in the UK or Russia over the last 200 years. And so we remain wedded to the idea of a disciplinary approach to knowledge without uh, to paraphrase Tagore's words, uh, uh, you know, keeping the windows shut and not letting winds of change blow. So we are open to dialogue with the other disciplines. And of course, the other disciplines are important. How can you study the great crash of 2008 without a sense of economics? How would you understand the arms race if you did not know the technologies of weapons of mass destruction? I mean, you don't have to know what they are, but you have to have an idea of where they originated and how their availability may have influenced the decisions of statesmen as much as of or stateswomen as of corporations. What academic credentials are required to qualify for the history humanities curriculum at the UG level? Does SAT score get counted? If so, what is the lower threshold? SAT score is not counted. There is no lower high threshold. Ashoka uh, admissions are common. There is no separate admission for history or humanities. You just join Ashoka. In the initial period, the first term, into the second term, the first year, you will study a range of disciplines, the foundation courses, introduction to critical thinking, critical thinking seminar, and then you start taking your options. So there are no academic credentials other than those that are required to get into Ashoka. And as you are perhaps aware, we are not a university where you get in simply based on your class 12 grade. So this 100%, 99%, 95% world has come to an end doesn't count here. We, of course, take the 12th class board exam, the 10th class board exam, the entrance exam, the interview, all of those into account. The faculty is not directly involved in that. There's an admissions office. So once you get in, it's up to you. Will the elective, non-elective? Of course, all the electives are open to anyone who does a minor. There's no issues. Uh, the mandatories are open. You don't have to do all seven. There are, there are specific numbers that you have to do. But the electives are open to anyone. Anyone in Ashoka can do the elective in history. Is the program mainly focused on Indian history? Yes, sir, it is. And the reason is very simple. We do not have historians who have worked on other parts of the world on our faculty. There are very few such historians on faculties in India. 
because people who work on other parts of the world normally do not choose to live and work in India. And this is my view. This is not university view. Most of the people who work on global history and world history are in highly developed countries, most of which ran global empires. The largest number are in the United States, which still aspires to run a global empire while pretending to be only a democratic republic interested in world peace. If you don't believe me, please ask yourself why since 1776, it has had only 11 years of peace. It's been involved in wars through much of the 20th century. Uh, but we do have histories of other countries taught in other ways. So there's the European history, which is compulsory for all students at Ashoka. Papers like reading history, reading archeology span are by no means India specific. And there are a number of us within the department who teach courses which are extra Indian. We don't leave India out, but it's India as seen as part of the wider world. I refer to environment and empire in the early modern world. That's one instance. But there are other ways which are very important in exposing people to learn about what I call extra Indian history. I don't think there's an Indian history and a non-Indian history. There is history with a capital. Now, one of them, of course, is we have a very important international relations department. Professor Srinath Raghavan, uh, Dr. Pallavi Raghavan, no relation. Uh, Dr. Anisha Sharma. We also have Dr. Nayan Chanda, who is a fluent French speaker, very distinguished journalist who has served in Indochina in, in, in Southeast Asia for over 25 years. Uh, earlier was uh, associated with Yale. So he teaches uh, extensively on Southeast Asia. We have papers on ancient Southeast Asia and its relations to South Asia. We have a colleague in uh, the political science department, uh, Dr. Ali Khan, who teaches about West Asian political thought. So there's a number of courses in Ashoka available on history beyond the subcontinent. I'm also happy to say there is a China Studies Center being set up next term, that is uh, spring 2021. Uh, uh, we will be having uh, Dr. Barnali Chanda, most unusual scholar, believe it or not, she's a specialist on ancient India and ancient China. So if you want to throw a, a pebble, please don't throw a stone. And it has to hit someone who knows Sanskrit and ancient Mandarin. Dr. Chanda is the person and she is offering a fascinating paper. I'd, I'd love to be, to be in her class, but I can't, uh, on uh, uh, cross-cultural uh, comparisons of ancient India with ancient China. And that I think is a space we will try to be expanding in the coming years. Uh, I think I would like to end here just to say, uh, history is always an exciting subject, never as much as now in a world which is on the cusp of great changes, ecological, technological, societal, cultural. And Ashoka is in India, probably one of the very good places to study it. We also have a very uh, important uh, uh, element in the undergrad program, which I should emphasize. Those students who want to are encouraged to write a short research thesis. They have to complete it in the monsoon term of their final year. Raven last year did a very fine thesis on the Jatakas, and he was one of four very brave students who did a thesis. And we'll be happy to know that they all did so well that we gave them a standing ovation at the end. And uh, those students who like Ashoka very much, who are not quite sure where to go next, stay on for the uh, postgraduate diploma this year, I think there are eight students in it. And uh, uh, this is history at a more advanced track, including a year long thesis. And for those who are interested, I'm fascinated no question has come up or thinking of admissions in the US where you require four years of undergraduate education. This is definitely counted over there. So I think I'd like to end over here. This is an exciting place to study history. And uh, uh, we would love to encourage anyone here to think of applying and yes, please look at us. Definitely for a major, if not for a minor, or a concentration and if none of the above, attend our lectures or just sign up for any course which is exciting enough. Thank you. Uh, I think we have some more questions left, so I'll read them out and uh, you could answer them. Uh, there's, there's a very pointed question uh, which reads, my son is in class 10, I'm searching for options. Found IIT Madras offers an integrated five years HS double E program. Does Ashoka provide something like that? No, ma'am, we don't. We don't have a master's in history and we don't have an integrated course. I have the greatest regard for IIT, uh, particularly IIT Chennai uh, and uh, the humanities uh, social science department is excellent. Uh, we don't have such an option, uh, but I will add and without any false modesty, since honesty is more important than uh, uh, modesty, please look at the faculty there and compare it to our faculty here.
I can guarantee you the humanities social science faculty here in terms of scholarship, that will speak for itself. But, but no, we don't have it. And I don't think Indian universities offer a five-year program. Personally, and this is strictly my view, the five-year makes sense if you're a science student and you get into an ISA, the Indian Institutes of Science Education Research. That is a fantastic five-year integrated BSc and SC. I don't think there's an integrated five-year humanities program in India of that quality yet. And in Ashoka, we haven't even tried it. What are the experiential courses syllabi linked to the UG curriculum? <sighs> this is a complicated question. Well, in Ashoka, we have co-curriculars and those include a range of courses. Uh, there's uh, uh, performing arts, there's uh, music, there's a range of those disciplines. We also have uh, uh, a department of the visual arts. Uh, there is a center for entrepreneurship. Uh, beyond that, uh, I think there is a range of other possibilities in the university, but I'm not quite sure what the question is, so I'm going to leave it there. Would it be possible to do a history and biology double major? As of today, no. And I think one reason, and let's be clear, is that biology is going to take a lot of your time. I don't think you can do a biology and physics major. And the reason is a lot of the biology time is going to be spent in the lab. What you can do, and believe me, it's not a second best, you could do history, with, you could do biology with history as a minor. And there is no reason that can't be done. Uh, but, but you do give me food for thought. It is possible in future, we can think of a double major in the sciences and arts, but it may need more time because in general in the sciences, not referring to biology in particular, the number of courses you have to do is more. Science teaching is more standardized than humanities teaching across the world. And uh, I would like to add to this that there are some sub history is one of those subjects uh, where you do not have a fixed order for taking courses. For example, there is this Indian history, uh, co uh, you know, trajectory that we follow over four courses. They can be taken in any order, although it's it's advisable that we take them in the in the chronological order. But there are subjects like economics or physics or computer science where there are a certain number of subjects sub courses that you need to take beforehand before you take other electives. So because of that, uh, much of your first or second year might be spent in doing those, in which time you may not be able to do, uh, you may not be able to do courses from history. So uh, un 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 until you have a, a clear uh, idea of you, of you are already, you know, until you're in a comfortable position to be able to finish your major in one of the sciences subjects, can you experiment with, you know, uh, subjects like political science or history? I think that, that's, that's another major reason. Career paths, very interesting question. Actually, history and uh, along with the sociological, all the social sciences and humanities, all options are open for you. The only things which are closed in this country, uh, you can't practice law, but you'll have to go and do a law degree. You can't do medicine and engineering in this country. Uh, other than that, everything's open to you. Uh, what do people who do history do? Well, a tiny number, not a very large number, goes on to study history and become historians. They become teachers or, or researchers, or scholars. Uh, but across the world, you'll find people who study history are there in the arts, they are in the professions. There's no reason you can't do an MBA. Somebody asked a question of the civil services, the media, publishing. So I, I don't think the social sciences prepare you for a career the way law or uh, degree in engineering or medicine too. Those are somewhat unique or architecture. Uh, but short of that, everything is open. So there's no ready-made answer to that. You'll have to find your way. You are interested in archaeology at the graduation level. Can I do it in your university? No, we don't have a graduate degree in archaeology. I don't know if there is a graduate degree in archaeology. Check out Deccan College Pune, but I'm not sure about it. I won't advise you to do it uh, because whoever you are, what do you really know about archaeology at the stage you're at? So I wouldn't suggest you narrow your options down now. If you're interested in archaeology, do a history degree in a university where there is provision for being taught by people with the knowledge of archaeology. We do have it. There may be other places. And uh, how do you get admission? In the regular way. What is Clio Dynamics? I'm really sorry. I've never heard this term. It's absolutely fascinating. I promise to look it up. You're concerned about the choice of subjects you want in the future. It's psychology and English. What should I do? You know something? I really wish I knew the answer to that question. Actually, there are two secrets. Nobody knows. Even you don't. What you should do depends on two things. Uh, my answer would be to reread Alice in Wonderland. You don't have to read the whole of it. 
There's a very famous on, uh, question. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. Alice is lost in Wonderland. She's walking on a path. She comes across a Cheshire cat and she asks the cat, which way does this path lead? Which way does this, where does this path lead to? And the cat gives a profoundly important answer. The cat said, it all depends on where you want to go. So where do you want to go? And depending on where you want to go, you can either do English or psychology or something else. And one submission I have is, get hold of someone who teaches psychology or teaches English in the university. Ideally, get someone who researches and teaches these. Because these disciplines in the university, whichever discipline you look at, are vastly different from what they are in school, particularly in India. The school subjects have very little relation to what they are in the university. You know, it's like, uh, uh, I read this really hilarious story about a Chinese couple who bought a very interesting dog. And the dog kept growing and growing and growing and it turned out to be an Asiatic black bear and they had to give it away to a zoo. So the, the difference between the discipline you learn in school and the discipline in college could be that between a deceptively sweet looking puppy dog and a black bear who's so enormous that it leads you out of house and home. Now you may want to have the black bear, but you'll have to build a different kind of enclosure to keep it. So before you come to this choice, talk to people who have done these disciplines, find some books by people in these disciplines. Can you have an internship at the university while being in 11th grade? I'm afraid not, but you're welcome to visit the university. You're more than welcome to visit and we're happy to get a student to take you around because I'm sure you'll have more in common with the students than the, the faculty and please be in touch with us. What careers does one pick up after studying history? I think I've answered that. What career uh, opportunities does it open? Yes, please go there's ahead. There's also this question about subject combinations that are good or popular with history. You have partially answered that. Probably you could uh, elaborate yes. a little more. You know, yes. Focus. There's also provision for history with economics. Only one student has done it in the past. There's no reason you can't do history and economics. You see, if you do history and another discipline, you need to do more courses. And you can pack only so many courses into three years, which means you have six terms. So that's the real constraint. The constraint is time. If you have a four-year, then there's more space to do that. So I think if the NEP comes in and as and when it comes in, if you have a four-year degree, we will have more breathing space for all of our courses. Because one of the things we are attempting in Ashoka is to give students this breadth across disciplines as well as depth within a discipline and where they want to, to do a double major or to do a major with a minor. So double major, which is most popular, as I said, is history with IR, but there are possibilities as with history with economics. There's no reason it, it shouldn't be possible. No, there aren't four compulsory courses. We've increased that. The, there are four compulsory papers on Indian history. So prehistory, proto-history up to the Mauryas, Mauryas to the 12th century is history two. There's history three, which is the 12th to the 18th century. And there's history four, which is the mid 18th to the present. There are those four. There's also European history because we do think a sense of European history will really help from the Renaissance to 1917, the Bolshevik revolution. and uh, there's a paper on reading history and reading archaeology. So if you add that, it's four plus one, four plus two plus one, it's seven compulsories. Yes, there is another question which starts, dear Dr. Rangarajan, and then there's nothing there. It's from Daita Bidla Datta. Ah, here it is, Daita Datta Assam Valley School. The students could not attend. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Daita, uh, Dr. Daita. Thank you so much, Dr. Datta. Is it a good idea to do a double major in economics history? We think so. The one student who did it was very happy. And there are more students making inquiries. Very few students attempted. We'd be very happy if more students attempted. What degree does Ashoka give? A humble BA. Do you have geography as a subject for major or minor? I regret we don't. We don't have a geography department. I don't think we plan to. We have now 13 majors. That's chemistry, physics, biology. There's mathematics. There's psychology. There's literature. There's history. Uh, there's philosophy, there's English. I, I might be leaving something out, I'm forgetting. But there's political science. So there, there, are, there are 13 majors and I think we will stay at 13. I don't think that's gonna go up. There are a number of minors. We have just added a minor in legal studies. So for instance, imagine if you come to Ashoka, you do history as a major, politics as a minor and a concentration in legal studies. Change that, you do history as a major, you do performing arts as a minor. One of our, some of our very fine historians have combined performing arts. There's now, by the way, a BA in English and performing arts, but I'm not here to talk about that, so I won't. Revanth, I think it would be nice if you add 
something about your experiences of studying history, the differences between different kinds of courses you've done, or whatever. Yeah, so uh, I think a natural question that would that would uh, come up in a session like this is how history at Ashoka is different from other universities, history in other universities, and also how history at Ashoka, and even professor has uh, you know hinted at this, how history at Ashoka uh, compares with history that we do in school or even in 11th and 12th standards, and uh, and I think. What I feel, what my experience with history at Ashoka, this could be completely be a personal experience. Others might not have felt this really, is that unlike in school or what I hear from other universities, what we learn is not facts. That's not the point of history at Ashoka at all. Because even if uh, there is the history handbook, so you could contact some of history students at already who are already in uh, in the university to uh, find that to learn more about it. There are actually very few courses. There are only 12 courses that you need to do uh, at Ashoka to get a history degree, which is not a lot, very many courses. And even the, and, and if you've gone through, uh, you know, the history, the Ashoka website as well, you will see that the time spent in class is also very little. Therefore, there is not so much facts that can be, uh, you know, you can be filled with. That's not the point of the course uh, syllabus at history or in Ashoka and abroad at all. Instead, what we learn is skills. What we get is the craft of uh, researching history. How does one uh, do history? And I think that is not that is that is that is something that's unique to Ashoka. But sadly, uh, we do not have it enough in our school level because when we read in uh, history in school, we just learn that such and such thing happened, but we don't uh, really know about how people arrived at that conclusion. How did somebody uh, uh, figure out? Uh, about Ashoka's life. How did people figure out that this was this, this was the year of his coronation, or he killed so many of his brothers, or he, uh, you know, became a Buddhist, or he renounced war, or whatever? You know, all of these things that we that we learn about uh, learn from of history in in school. How do people come to those conclusions? And I think that is what's uh, unique to Ashoka. So in our classes, we are given primary sources as well as secondary sources. Primary source being that the raw material that one that historians analyze in order to deduct facts, as well as secondary sources. And we also read current research papers, research papers that are very recent, that are that have been, uh, that are pro probably even two years old. And some of the scholars, you know, all the professors that, we, that we teach at Ashoka are all scholars who are currently working in the field. They also uh, talk about their own work, the work that's ongoing. Therefore, you really know about how the historian approaches the subject. And I think that's the that's the primary strength of Ashoka University, and we we have several avenues to build on that strength. For example, as Professor said, we have the uh, provision of the thesis. Thesis meaning an argument. So you you get, you get the space to write a ten thousand word essay on one argument that you want to make on some minor, some very specific question that you have from history across the world, India, any period, any theme. It's all your choice. And uh, it also so happens that Ashoka, Ashoka professors do not need to conform to such a, you know, uh, a fixed set of guidelines. They can provide any course that they want to. For example, Professor Lahiri, she, uh, she has given what's called an independent study module on food in, food in the ancient world, for which she had to do her own research. I mean, this, this is not something that she had written any books on, but she was made to uh, research on these subjects and come up with primary sources to deal with in class. And uh, Professor Rangarajan teaches courses that are not found any elsewhere, like animal histories and so on. So we have these. Uh, we we have the thesis where we do the research. We have uh, we have what's called the independent study module, as I just said, where we can if there's some question, some field that we want to know more about, but there isn't enough space in any of the courses that that are already offered. We can approach a professor, and the professor and and the student can meet twice or once a week, exchange readings, and discuss that subject. So I think. Ashoka gives you the space to uh, to uh, face or countenance the subject as it stands today, and uh, know and learn and get equipped the skills required to make a contribution to the subject. So it, it's it's that critical eye that Ashoka offers that makes it. Uh, I think Ashoka and Pro, Ashoka's history program uh, unique. And actually, I, I was going to ask this question to Professor as well. So how do you what do you think about the current history field? What's what's something that's what are some interesting uh, developments that are happening today 
that maybe our many of our audience also may, may the parents in our audience may have studied history in the in their university time but things may have changed now so i think i think that will really give a glimpse of how ashoka history is done at ashoka or any other subject as for that matter well there's this larger issue today of what are called connected histories you look at history not in terms of separate silos but connections so something which perhaps was not thinkable earlier so very fine book which came out some years ago uh, uh crossing the bay of bengal looked at the bay of bengal and the linkages of south and southeast asia not only in terms of traders and merchants but indian indentured laborers who went and worked in burma malaya and various parts of southeast asia and this is a very fine book by sunil amrit so if you look at this book you look at the bay of bengal not just as a sheet of water that separates Uh, these countries but also brings them together and then the changes over the last 140 years so by the 1930s they start uh, putting all sorts of controls on people coming in uh, yes i did not mention uh, dr mahmud kuria there's a sad reason but uh, well it's also a happy reason he was on our faculty he has just become a visiting faculty but yes i would love to mention him and it's good that you went, uh, that you raised him now because uh, dr kuria works on uh, the early modern indian ocean uh, the medieval indian ocean Uh, the 15th century and earlier and he recently has got a very prestigious project uh, at leiden university and he didn't want to leave ashoka so he's going to be with us for half the year and his work is very interesting it looks at the 15th century ocean indian ocean when people of different cultures societies were traversing the ocean and uh, sometimes they came into conflicts uh, one person stole goods from another's ship somebody had a bill of lading or its equivalent and they paid the correct amount so which law would apply the law of the owner the law of the captain of the merchant ship or the law of the port where it docked i don't think there's an easy answer but you know watching this evening's uh, uh, news program on the brexit and uh, looking at all the trucks that are waiting in france to go back into britain and the trucks waiting in britain go to go into france i was wondering how did they solve this problem in the 15th century so he looks at very interesting paper trails he does a very interesting paper on on the monsoon in indian ocean history so you know remember the word monsoon comes from an arabic word so how how did how did the monsoon play a role in 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 these histories of the western indian ocean so i think that you know one of the things about history is we are looking more at histories of connections so dr raghavan's work a dangerous place it's a very important phrase used by uh, ambassador uh, patrick moynihan uh who later also was a very important senator in the united states a very important scholar and he said india is the most dangerous place and uh, why, why was an american saying that and this is a very interesting book it looks at american indian indo american relations in the long 200 year period well, you know it goes back to the 18th century and traces it forward so there are all sorts of fascinating nuggets but there's also very important insight i mean i didn't note it i read this book that uh uh the the secretary of state of the united states uh, hsm actually uh, thought he knew a lot about india because in many of the meetings he would say i have the best book ever written on india by my bedside and i read it for half an hour at night <laughs> believe it or not it was not at kipling and not a very good guide kipling was a, a, an arch imperialist and racist he thought of india completely in terms of racial stereotypes he lived his entire life in the punjab he wrote this marvelous book which all of us have encountered at different ages the jungle book which out without ever having stepped into the central indian forest you know this is a fantastic cracking good read but not to be taken too literally and rakman points out that there's something really serious some of the stereotypes that people like hsn were dealing with dalis sorry not hsn were dealing with when they looked at india was drawn from kipling so i think there are new kinds of connected histories in terms of material flows in terms of ideas in terms of societies literary cultural ecological and i think that's something very interesting so my colleague uh, dr pratyek nath is co-editing a book he, he, uh, very interesting it's on the horse and its role in indian history across the ages so besides telling us how many horses there were what they ate and how fast they ran which i'm sure you can find out in the book it seems the horse was enormously important not only as a military artifact but also as import so indians for centuries have been importing horses from west and central asia by the overland and the sea route and paying for it in huge amounts of gold and silver so when you think of the foreign exchange crisis and perhaps this is the wrong term to use but certainly you think of the outflow of gold and silver a lot of it was for horses which were very important in warfare and which were also a status symbol so if you were a high ranking noble in vijayanagara you would ride a really good horse which would come from 
Persia, Arabia, or Central Asia. You wouldn't be seen caught dead on, on a local horse. But that that cost a lot of silver. Yes. And uh, I would like to add that I think, I mean, I'm not sure, but I think these days there's a much more creative reading of sources as well. For example, uh, as Professor said, uh, Professor Nayanjot Lahiri has written a book right before joining Ashoka uh, on Emperor Ashoka. the biography of ashoka people have worked on ashoka uh, a lot i mean the, but lot of the interpretation of let's say the uh, the ashoka edicts has been on uh, questions of ashokan polity ashokan uh, you know a state building and larger state building questions but professor lahiri does something that's unique i think in in the question in the in the history of uh, ashokan scholarship which is she looks at the location of these sources she look at looks at the location of uh you know what is the kind of landscape in which these edicts were etched and what does that tell up tell us about the communicator that ashoka was i think this is a new kind of uh, creative reading of sources that 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 not just our scholars not just uh, the, the scholars that we read in classes uh, uh you know employ but also uh, the the, uh, the scholars who teach at ashoka as well and i think we have a last few set of questions sir and we will answer that and i think we can conclude the session so, so i am afraid i know very little about home schooling but uh, you are welcome to remain in touch i'm sure you're doing a fabulous job uh, the only senior i know who was home schooled is uh, the famous biologist ullas karant uh, because his uh, his father was very upset that they did not let them speak kannada in school and dr shivram karant who was a very great literary giant probably comparable even to rabindranath tagore of course could teach uh, uh, the entire range of sciences and arts and uh, i think uh, his uh, son daughter and uh, others only saw uh, uh, college education when they went in for their for their undergrad degrees uh, yes there is briefing during the admission process on the courses but i think that probably logically happens after you come in and you're welcome to to talk to us and learn more about it i don't think you should worry so much about it as long as you're sure you want to do one of the subjects here you're welcome to join there may be limitations i i think that if you want to do the exact sciences physics chemistry mathematics biology uh you may require some knowledge prior of mathematics uh having said that in case you do join ashoka and you do any of these disciplines and some of the others such as psychology you will compulsorily have to relearn calculus because professor bhatia assures us that whatever calculus is taught in schools they'd like to re relearn it and teach it better i we think there's also a question on uh, name change that change trend of name changing of cities in uttar pradesh i didn't see that can you that's the last question i think people ah, have got that your, ah. your view on that oh god that's a highly charged question there are different views on it don't ask what the changes yeah. on any such things ask why they're changing it Yeah. and this is not the first time name changes are happening uh, i grew up in india where the cities were madras bombay and calcutta which have since been been renamed chennai mumbai and kolkata now in these cases uh, it has been argued certainly i can say this with chennai that people in tamil always called it chennai madras is an english name and it was felt that this name is more Uh, accessible in linguistic terms to a wider uh, set of people but please remember the madras high court still remains the madras high court the madras iit still remains the madras iit and i don't know if you watch election results the election commission which is one of the most remarkable bodies in india still calls it madras uh, as far as the other changes are concerned i think you should look at place names in other parts of the world so why don't you look at place names in israel where a number of uh, Uh, places uh, had an arab name they've been given a hebrew name or you look very importantly at uh, uh, change names in in turkey uh, so uh, there are different views of history there's a view of history that there are different layers and a, a composite culture consists of those layers and there's another view of history that there are certain layers which marked a break from the past so i am sure that the people who are renaming I uh, Ilhabad as Prayagraj would argue.
Hi, uh, Raven. I think there's been a power failure. So let's just wait for a couple of minutes if, and see if the professor can come back. If not, we can end the session, you know, with the last announcements. Uh, yeah, there's a question on, I think some of the questions I can still take them. So there's, there's also a question on scholarship. The scholarship, as professor has said, is entirely need based. Uh, and that is that it has nothing to do with the department, department of Ashoka, uh, department of history. It's, it's a admissions, a uh, wing. Uh, answer. Yeah. And I think. I think, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think prof it's, it's going to take some, take a while for professors uh, to get back his power. So I'll, I think I'll conclude the session, uh, you know, in right now in a few minutes. And uh, as always, I think it was a brilliant, wonderful session with professor Rangarajan. And as, as I said, student Ashoka always look forward to listening to him and getting, you know, uh, book recommendations. And I wish we, ha I wish uh, we could have, have had that, uh, you know, experience now as well. Uh, and before we wrap up the session, I have a few last points about sessions that are, uh, the, that, that, are, that, are that are, that are, that are, that are, that are to follow uh, today's event. Please, uh, before leaving, uh, drop some feedback in the chat box. And our next uh, webinar is going to be about uh, English. And it is, it's titled Why Study in English at Ashoka University. It is scheduled for next Tuesday, 29th December, 6 p.m. As you can see in the slide that's displayed. And it's by, it's going to be delivered by Professor Jonathan Gil Harris, the HOD of English department. And the registration link will be provided in the chat box in a few, in a few seconds. We would also like, you, like to invite you for the upcoming open house on undergraduate program and admissions with Ali Imran, vice president of engagement at Ashoka University. This webinar is scheduled for Sunday, uh, 3rd of January at 11 a.m. The registration for that as well will be provided in the chat box. Uh, lastly, I would like to inform our audience, and since there, has, there have been explicit, explicit questions on, on this as well, that round two applications for the undergraduate program are now open, and the last day to submit your application in this round is on 11th January, and you can find the application process and the application procedure in on www.ashoka.edu.in. And in case you have still have some queries and would like to know something specific about Ashoka, its departments, admissions, or, uh, or any other aspect of Ashoka university experience, you can mail apply at the rate ashoka.edu.in or call any of the numbers that are provided on the screen uh, before you. And thank you. I hope all of you are taking care and advanced happy new year and Merry Christmas.